As Jesus was starting out on his way to Jerusalem, a man came running up to him, knelt down and asked, Good teacher, what must I do to in inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good, Jesus asked. Only God is truly good. But to answer your question, you know the commandments. You must not murder. You must not commit adultery. You must not steal. You must not testify falsely. You must not cheat anyone. Honor your father and mother. Teacher, the man replied, I've obeyed all of these commandments since I was young. Looking at the man, Jesus felt genuine love for him. There is still one thing you haven't done, he told him. Go and sell all your possessions and give the money to the poor, and you will have treasures in heaven. Then come and follow me. At this, the man's face fell, and he went away sad, for he had many possessions. The word of God. You may be seated. You're a good, good father. Thank you, Alex. It's who you are. And I'm loved by you. It's who I am. Church, I'm going to venture to say that there's massive roadblocks in our lives when it comes to receiving that love. Massive. And today, we're not going to be able to tiptoe around the good news that God has for you today in a way that will transform you, not affirm you. How many love the times when the message affirms what you're doing in your life, and you're like, I'm, I'm in, that's totally me. <laughs> like, come follow me, because I'm following Jesus, and this is really good, right? More often than not, how many of you feel like, wow, that, were you speaking directly to me? I mean, if you have, by the way, we're never speaking directly to you. God is. Okay, we, 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 haven't, we haven't talked to your family and found out what you're not doing in your life and how you're messing up and figured that we would prepare a message just for you. <laughs> right? <laughs> Howard, that was good. But the Holy Spirit knows you and loves you and needs you to hear what God wants to say to you. That's why this space will always challenge your life not simply affirm it. Is that okay? We used to call it back when I was growing up, the pastor would say, tuck your toes in, I'm about to come step on them. What he means is the Holy Spirit's about to come and challenge us and where you get offended or where you feel defensive or where there's a hurt that's rubbed, lean in because God is trying to speak to you. And that's a really good litmus test that he's getting your attention. Good? We say here a lot that we have as a church a strong agenda for your life. Because we believe God has a strong agenda for your life. And so we're going to dive into this. And I'm going I'm to use this line I've been using the last three weeks as we've been in this uh, From Heaven to Earth series. Thank God for Christmas. Ah, okay. Uh, <laughs> uh, let, me say, let me say it differently. Maybe this will help. Whoa, excuse me. <laughs> Maybe Christmas brings for some of us a sense of sadness because of what we're facing. The holiday itself. So let me say, thank God for the coming of Jesus at Christmas time. That's better, right? That's better. I can, I can cheer that right? Because that's what this season is all about. It's about Jesus, a gift to humanity from heaven to earth. And we needed this gift. We're only doing well today because of this gift. He is our hope. We learned a couple weeks ago and, and our, he is the only hope and he is our joy. We talked about it last week and how many of you threw away some lists? Whether they're physical, in your mind, on your phone, you can delete, you know. You don't have to throw your phone away, though it might be healthy. Because we want to do God's will. 
And I said this last week, I want to say it again. What if heaven has less to do with being in good circumstances and more to do with being close to a person? What if Christmas is really the story of heaven introducing itself to earth because heaven is a person? And what if we need, because of our fickleness, to be introduced to him every year as a reminder that 2,000 years ago, Emmanuel, God with us, came to earth to save us, not judge us, right? And so we read in Luke chapter 2, 8 through 13, that night there were shepherds staying in the fields nearby, guarding their flocks of sheep. Suddenly, an angel of the Lord appeared among them, and the radiance of the Lord's glory surrounded them. They were terrified, but the angel reassured them, do not be afraid. Peace be with you. He said, I bring you good news. This is a message of love that will bring great joy to all, not just small joy, not just little joy, not just circumstantial joy, but great joy to all people. The Savior, yes, the Messiah, the Lord, there's our hope, has been born today in Bethlehem, the city of David. This is a promise of peace. This is a promise of love. This is a promise of joy, and it is our hope. Heaven had come to earth, a gift, Jesus, but not just any gift, a person. When, when we say that you come to Jesus and you make a statement of belief and faith and I'm going to follow you because you are the leader of my life and you need to be the leader of my life, I'm not someday getting heaven. I'm getting heaven because I get Jesus. I get heaven right now. We must remember that heaven is more about a person than a place. And Jesus came and he lived and he died and he rose and he gives us his Holy Spirit and he goes and he sits at the right hand of the Father and he says, keep watch because I'm coming back. And it changes the way we live. We get up every day wondering, could this be the day? Could this be the day? Oh God, let it be the day that either I get to go be with you or you're coming back. That'd be pretty radical. And what did Jesus bring? What did he bring? Absolutely everything you need. You don't need anything else. Yeah, when it comes to living, it's good to have food, shelter, and clothing. Keeps you alive, doesn't it? Outside of that, all you need is Jesus. He's going to bless you with a lot of things that you wanted and you got. And sometimes we make those things the thing instead of him the thing. And we worship creation instead of creator. And so we got to be brought back to these moments to get it in order. The gift, this gift comes in so many forms. And over the next remaining weeks leading up to Christmas, we're going to explore those gifts and the impact that they can have in and through us. And so let me grab this. Let me grab this for y'all. Can we get like some Christmas music playing in the background while I do this? Go ahead. Like uh, joy to the world. Oh, not that one. All the boys and girls. Yeah, wrong one. But it's fun, right? Yes. Let it go. Beautiful. Okay, that's all. David Phelps' version is way better than that. So Jesus comes and he is a gift that we are given the freedom to choose or reject. Isn't that awesome? And so we're given this gift in Jesus. And man, it is a gift that just keeps giving. And the last couple weeks, we unwrap this gift of Jesus that is hope, and we unwrap this gift of Jesus that is joy, and this week, we get to unwrap this gift of Jesus that is... Oh, well done. Yes. And I, I put these up here so that, so that you can just have this in your face all morning. If I'm not saying it, you see it, right? Any visual learners in the room? You're welcome. May you see this in your sleep. Because this might be the most important element of this gift 
that we've been given. It also is the thing the enemy of our soul has corrupted the most in this world. God made it beautiful because it was an expression of what he thinks and believes about us. And the enemy of our soul has cheapened it. So this Christmas, let's redeem it. Here's what I want to say. I'm going to, I'm going to give us um, three thoughts this morning. Alex calls these organizational sentences. <laughs> Those of you, I sat and listened to him for eight weeks. In eight weeks, we got an organizational sentence. I knew what was coming, where we were going, how we were going to end. It felt good. Right? So, so here's, what I want you, here's what I want you to know. Right? God loves you. God loves you. I also want to talk about what keeps us from receiving that love. And then I want to try to share a little bit longer on how do you receive it. Because I think we struggle to receive it. These roadblocks that I talked about. Okay? God loves us, loves you. What keeps us from receiving and how do I receive it? So let me say this to you. God loves you. Matter of fact, say this with me. God loves me. Ready? God loves me. Whether you've made a decision to follow him or not, whether you get it right every day or not, even when you get it wrong, the God of this universe passionately wholeheartedly, unconditionally, and you are a mess, and I am a mess, and I am broken, and you are broken, and he loves me. And may the weight of that beauty just sit on you. Because everything in your life has been trying to convince you you're unlovable. Every lie is tearing down a truth that you are deeply loved. And if that fails to land, then there is no hope. I want to take you to some scripture, but I want to share something with you that's off script if I can, because I think we get confused about something that I think is really important. When we walk through this pandemic over these last couple of years, what we learned in the church world, I'm not saying what we learned here, I'm saying what we learned in the church world was that we had a massive failure of discipleship. And the reason we had a failure of discipleship is because Christians put all their eggs in a Sunday morning basket. That's why. We had a one day over everyday faith and we thought that that not only would change us, but it would change the world. And what we discovered or what we're discovering, not just in the people of the church, but in leadership itself, that we don't know the voice of the Holy Spirit and we can know the voice of the Holy Spirit every moment of every day, that we're biblically illiterate to a large degree and that we don't have community that won't just affirm us, but will speak truth in love, admonish us because we love each other. So, so let me help you understand something about biblical illiteracy and loving the Bible. We can't miraculously put the love inside of you for God's word and doing it on Sunday morning a certain way won't do that either. I'm yelling because, man, there is a frustration in me that we think that it has to be some specific way, some amount, and all of a sudden you're going to walk out of here loving God's word. No, if you don't love Jesus, then you won't love, that was timely, if you don't love Jesus, then you won't love God's word. And I can't make you love Jesus. 
But if you let Jesus fall all over you with his love and you will return that love back, something about God's word will grow inside of you and you'll want it every day. Why? Because it's conversation and getting to know the one in whom you love and who loves you. Matter of fact, he loved you first. So the question isn't, how do we get you to love the Bible? The question becomes, how do we get people to love Jesus? And I think he did it. I just think he did. Doesn't mean we're not going to preach the word of God. That's what we do. We will always do that. Every truth will come from the word of God. That's assumed. But we must love Jesus. Because he's loved us. And it's received. So let's go to the word of God. Because that's what we do. But we fall in love with the word of God because we've fallen in love with God. And we love God, so it makes us love his word. And we love his word, and so it makes us love God. Those things go together. You with me? I, matter of fact, let me just say, we were processing this, right? And I said, could it be true that if I don't love God's word, I might not love God? I don't know. Just leave that one out there. John 3, 16. For this is how God loved the world. He gave his one and only son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. By the way, it starts now when you step into a relationship with Jesus. And so death we don't fear. Verse 17. God sent his son in the world not to judge the world but to save the world through Jesus. This is how God loved the world. He gave his only son. John 15, 9 through 13. I have loved you even as the Father has loved me. Remain in my love. When you obey my commandments, you remain in my love. Just as I obey my Father's commandments and remain in his love. I have told you these things so that you will be filled with my joy. Yes, your love will overflow. This is my commandment. Love each other in the same way that I've loved you. There is no greater love than to lay down one's life for one's friend. There is no greater love. It doesn't get any better in marriage. It doesn't get any better in sexuality. It doesn't get any better than to lay down your life for another person. That's the greatest example of love. 1 John 3.16, we know what real love is because Jesus actually does it. He gave up his life for us, so we also ought to give up our lives for our brothers and sisters. 1 John 4, 9 through 12, God showed how much he loved us by sending his one and only son into the world so that we might have eternal life through him. This is real love. Not that we loved God but that he loved us and sent his son as a sacrifice to take away our sins. To take away our sins. Why? Because the more the sin comes out, the more the love of God gets to come in. Dear friends, verse 11, since God loved us that much, we surely ought to love each other. No one has ever seen God, but if we love each other, God lives in us, and his love is brought to full expression in us. Church, God loves you. Do you hear it? It's extreme. It's extravagant. It blows past all of our excuses, all of our lies. It cuts to the core of your unloveliness. And it lands on a heart that he desperately wants fully. So to the degree you experience God's love towards you, that he sees you as beautiful and radiant, you'll be changed. Do you hear me? Is it, the love, it is the love of God that changes you. It is not a person. It is not a place. It is not a thing. It is the person, Jesus that when he loves you, when you allow him to love you, he will change you. He will transform you. Whew. So what keeps you from receiving God's love? 
Here's what I want you to do. I want you to take a couple minutes, if you would. Somebody next to you. Two, three, not one. What do you think keeps you from God's love? Take a few minutes. Ready, set, go. And if you don't know the person next to you, introduce yourself. Okay. Okay. Now, now, hear, hear my heart. Um, th- this one matters most. You're, 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 you're going to feel an intensity from me today. I'm not, I'm not angry. I'm angry at the enemy of our soul because he's warped this in our lives. I'm angry at the enemy of our soul because he's made us believe that we know what it is. But in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, the last verse, these three things will last forever, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. Church, we can't get this wrong. So, so I'm, I'm coming and have prayed, Holy Spirit, if you want to kill this message that I've prepared and speak something, do it but may you speak. And I'm trusting that the moment the words leave to the moment it gets to your ears, he does whatever he needs to to those words so that they come across to your heart. Because people who get the love of Jesus actually go out and share the love of Jesus. This is big. So what keeps us? What did you conclude? Just yell them out for me. What keeps us from receiving God's love? Pride. What else? Lies. Schedules. Yeah. Man, isn't that practical? Shame. Loss of control. Fear. Guilt. Not good enough. Ourselves. Just put a big old circle around self. Mm -hmm. Our human thought. What else? Idols. Whew. The pool of Bethsaida. What else? Judgment. Security. Security. Whoa. Power or the desire for. What else? Regret. Do you understand there's a lot of things that are standing in the way of you receiving the love of Jesus? And that we ought to sit down in a group at some point and write as many of them as we can think of so that the enemy's lies are exposed. So that's all the time we're going to spend on that one. Great job handling point two. We preach together, do we not? So let's go to Mark chapter 10, 17 through 27. As Jesus was starting out on his way to Jerusalem, a man came running up to him, knelt down and asked, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? We are so hard on this guy. And he is us. Okay? And he comes, he is doing this right. Let's not give him a hard time. He comes running up and he gets on a knee and bows before him. That's good. And then he calls him good. That's good. And then he says, what must I do to inherit eternal life? That is an amazing question. So far, so good. This is good. 
Jesus says, why do you call me good? Only God is truly good. Do you know what's happening here? Jesus is letting him know who he is and letting him know who Jesus is. Why do you call me good? Only God is good. Hey, guess what? I am God, therefore you are right. But if only God is good, then you are not. And that's important because of what he's about to say. That was very play-like, dramatic. Thank you. But to answer your question, you know the commandments. You must not murder. You must not commit adultery. You must not steal. You must not testify falsely. You must not cheat anyone and honor your father and mother. Teacher, the man replied, I've obeyed all these commands since I was young. <laughs> Looking at the man, Jesus felt Whew. he's not mad at him. He's not angry with him. He just feels genuine love, and he's about to give him a chance to receive it. Just like he's giving us a chance to receive it. There's still one thing you haven't done, he told him. Go and sell all your possessions and give the money to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then, and here's the thing, then come follow me. Come be with me. You get me. Go do all that. Hey, guys, by the way, Jesus isn't just testing his heart. He wants him to go get rid of it all. We love to soft sell this and be like, oh, Jesus was just testing him. If he would have said yes, he would have let him keep all of his stuff. Uh-uh. Read the rest of this. But we're going to stop right here. At verse 22, at this the man's face fell, and he went away sad, for he had many possessions. Oh, whoa. Your love for everything else will keep you from receiving God's love for you. Your love, my love, your wants, your desires for everything else will keep you from receiving. God's not going to compete. He's already done it. He's already done more than anyone, anything has ever done any time God has done it. He has proven his love for you. And now he's inviting us to follow him. And this young man had too much. And he walked away sad. The devil won't get you to hate God. He will get you to love yourself more. That's what he'll do. Uh, illustrate. I had the pressure of the pool and the list, so I felt like I needed another visual. Anybody else pack like that? We're like, you got to get somebody to sit on it so you can zip it, right? And it's like, that's your heart. Full of love, wants, and desires. And a lot of times, and you have to determine the degree, it is full of love and wants and desires outside of the love of God. For this world, driven by flesh, tricked by the devil himself, and we let our hearts get full. And so Jesus comes and he says, repent and believe. Do you know what another word for repent and believe that I'm just going to throw out there? It might be surrender. Empty your suitcase. But we love it because it has everything in there that makes us comfortable. Even the things that are destroying you that you've become comfortable with because they're your new security blanket. Your lies, your traumas, the abuse, the misbeliefs, all crowding. And we're like, surrender, repent, change, empty my suitcase. No, I got a better idea. 
I'll just get a bigger suitcase. Right? I'll just do whatever I have to do to open this suitcase that has stuff in it, looks like Christmas presents, so we're not going to look. No, I checked. And so now it's like, and here's the problem with this is your, yours and my dysfunction is just going to fill it if it's even possible to expand your heart with more of the same because we've not dealt with the core problem that your love for everything else is keeping you from receiving God's love for you. And so we got to ask God to take those loved ones and desires and redirect them through the power of his Holy Spirit. We've got to empty the suitcase. Sometimes that can happen in a moment. Sometimes that will take a life as you are pulling things out and dealing with them. How do I receive this love? This is what we'll close with. Some of you are like, you just said close? Kind of. We have to start with this understanding that we know God loves us. I have to tell you just a quick little story before we go to point three. I was a youth pastor. I was a youth pastor for 20 years, youth and worship pastor. I was in my home church. I'd been a youth pastor for about four years. I was a semi-pro hockey chaplain for the Peoria Rivermen. And I had about five or six of these Peoria Rivermen hockey players coming into my life and mentoring them. And one of them I mentored so well, my wife actually fell in love with him and they ran off together, my first wife. Now some of you right now are just processing for the first time that I had a first wife. I did. Ran off together. I told this young hockey player how to be a great husband and where I was missing it. And he came along and did the exact things that I wasn't doing. You want to talk about betrayal? And I did everything in my power. I waited, I prayed, I did all that. But one thing specific that I did one night at the lowest moment, at the darkest moment in my life was I sat on my couch in a really dark little house that someone had let me borrow because I refused to move home with mom. And I got out my guitar and I sang these words. Jesus loves me. This I know. For the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong. They are weak, but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me. Because I needed to know, be reminded that in the darkest moment he loved me. Now, I've been married 22 years to the most amazing person I've ever met in my life. God redeems. That's why we don't shame divorce around here. We walk with people through it. But Jesus loves me. And he loves you. And we have to start there. That's the start. And then we have to identify and name the things that is keeping us from receiving this love and deal with them. Surrender. Empty the luggage. But here's the final, final thought. Jonathan Edwards used this simple analogy to get to the heart of this. He said, there is a difference between having a rational judgment that honey is sweet and having a sense of its sweetness. You can know honey is sweet because someone tells you, but you don't really know its sweetness until you've tasted it. And you can know God loves you because someone told you, but you don't really know God loves you until you've tasted his love. So how do I receive God's love so that I can taste it and not just be told it. It is a posture that you commit to as a follower of Jesus, and I'm going to give it three things, and then we're done. The first one is 
that we have got to be dissatisfied with our current spiritual state. We have got to be dissatisfied with our current spiritual state, with what you currently know about Jesus. We can't survive on yesterday's vision of God's goodness. Without a vision, the people perish. Without a daily, fresh revelation of who God is, our relationship with him will dry up. That's the verse. It's cultivating a holy discontent. If there is all this love for me, and that love will transform me for the inside out, and not just me, but everyone around me, because I will learn to love them the way God loved me, then I need to be discontent when it is not present. It starts with this discontent. We live in a been there, done that culture, and the great danger is in developing a been there, done that form of Christianity. I know God loves me, that Jesus died for me, and my sins are forgiven. I got it. Well, what is that, I got it, doing in and through you? How is he working that to the deepest places of your heart that impacts your family and your marriage and your job and your community and your neighbors and the barista at Starbucks? No, I got it. Then one day someone says, do you really believe God loves you? And your shallowness is exposed by your answer. A.W. Tozer says in The Pursuit of God, we've been snared in the coils of a false logic which which insists that if we have found him, we need no more seek him. And in the midst of this great chill, there are some who will not be content with false logic. They want to taste, to touch with their hearts, the wonder that is God. Oh, have you lost your wonder in God? Go get it back. Jacob would not let God go until he blessed him and forever walked with a limp as a result. Oh, it'd be so much more fun to see limp people walking around with a limp. Right? Contend for his presence. Don't settle for a faith in which you cannot know this love at work in your heart every day whether it's a feeling some days or pure faith others. Don't settle for a faith in which you cannot know this love at work in your heart every day. Second, ask God to guide your heart into his love. Ask God. This is a prayer, folks. It's a prayer. We can use it. We can pray it every day. God, guide my heart today into your love. Some of us are carrying a lot of baggage on this. And the person who prays this prayer is looking for something more than he or she already has. Lord, direct my heart into your love because I'm not satisfied with what I had yesterday about you. I want something again today. Steve, it's what led your dad to get alone with God every morning. Some of us carry this baggage, whether it's your view of God or our view of self. And whenever we think about God, our first instinct, though we believe in God, is to picture him with a frown on his face. Stop it. That's why I love the Jesus on Chosen. What a smile. What if you started picturing God with this beautiful smile on his face? He doesn't have to be fully satisfied with you to smile at you. Think, parents, of how you are with your kids. Man, you are a brat right now, doggone it, but I love you. (laughs) Hmm. You feel he's angry with you, that he's condemning you, and you need this prayer. God, guide my heart into your love. And if you don't begin to pray this prayer and see God do this, you will live in a world where you think God owes you. Tim Keller put it this way. He said, let me give you the asset test. Your spirit of wonder stays there even when things go bad. You see when things go bad, when problems happen. Here you can tell the difference between a moralist and a Christian. A moralist says, what good is all my religion? What good is coming to God? What good is all of this? I tried hard to be a Christian. I'm trying hard to be obedient to God. And what good is it? God owes me. And you see, you get mad. You say, I've been trying real hard. And now look what's going on in my love life. Look what's going on in my career. And you get bitter. Why? Because God owes you you. And a Christian keeps that spirit of wonder. A Christian says, yeah, my career hasn't gone too well. My love life hasn't gone too well, but it's astonishing. It's amazing that God is as good as he is. He is to me. It's all grace. That spirit of wonder, that sense of being a miracle, that sense of everything that comes to you being an absolute mercy. That's an asset test. 
Right? That was, Keller preached that, but it was good. (laughs) All that we learn of God will only frighten us away from him if we do not see him as loving and merciful, merciful and full of grace. Christians, to the degree that you behold the free grace of God, to the degree that you meditate on it and you let it become a holy fire in your heart, to the degree that you experience in a sense and behold the love of God, to that degree, you're going to find that in difficulties, you'll be able to say, oh, well, my father must have a purpose here because he loves me. And besides that, he doesn't owe me a good life. He owes me a far worse life than the one I've got right now. And you can handle anything. And when good things come, you say, behold, what a miracle. And the very fact that you can get up in the morning and say, I'm a Christian. Who would have thought it? There's a spirit of wonder about you, and if you lost that, you're slipping back into moralism. You're slipping back into thinking, oh, I guess what it means to be a Christian is to do. It's religion. If your heart is taken up with the Father's love, it cannot help but choose to be overpowered and conquered and embraced by Him. Oh, God, overpower and embrace and conquer this heart. Empty the suitcase. And then put it back in order. Some of you think God is cold and aloof and harsh and demanding. And these thoughts are rooted in your mind. And you need this prayer. God, guide my heart into your love. Ask God and go on asking until your heart begins to thaw in the warmth of the love of God. He will answer prayer. God, guide my heart into your love. Lastly, gaze into the love of God that is Jesus. Obsess over Jesus. Just obsess over him. I bought a book recently with this thought. Tim Keller, Jesus the King. I'm just going to obsess over Jesus. I can't, you can't go wrong that way. I'm just going to gaze at Jesus. I'm just going to get caught up in Jesus. How many of you gaze at yourself more than you gaze at Jesus? Oh, we'll just let that be rhetorical then. One thing I ask, Lord, Steve, I hate to keep pointing you out, but I know we lost dad this past week. I cannot tell you how amazing it was when your sister said to the room, how many of you people in this room, this was packed last night with people at Steve's dad's funeral. She said, how many of you people in the room when you, you, you did not get out of a conversation with Steve's dad without hearing the gospel message of Jesus, almost everybody in the room raised their hand. Obsessed with Jesus. One thing I ask, Lord, this is what I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to seek him in his temple. Psalms 27. Have you ever noticed how people who don't like each other will glance at each other, while people who like each other will just stare at each other? Renee, you were up here doing the announcements, and he was just gazing. There's this smile on his face. I pointed out to Steve. I'm like, look at this. This is hilarious. I mean, it's awesome, but it's hilarious, right? He's like... It was awesome. (laughs) Because people who are desperately in love will gaze at each other. Isaac Watts used another word to say the same thing in his famous hymn, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross, on which the Prince of Glory died. My richest gain, I count but loss. And pour contempt on all my pride. Survey, church. Ponder, meditate on the love of God. Gaze into his love in Jesus Christ. And watch your love for him grow. What a Christmas gift. Why? Because you cannot give a love you've not received. And we've been called to give this love. So this Christmas, what if we gazed? and obsessed and pray to prayer guide me into your love and God discontent and contend for the presence of God over everything else I'm going to ask you to stand there's a song that and in these moments this isn't like oh the last song it's the end of the morning this is the last song the beginning of your heart transformation in this area Do you understand? This is a prayer. As a church, we don't sing songs out of ritual. We sing songs as prayers because sometimes it's just a better way to say it. And this song says, I am your beloved. You have bought me with a price. 
And the one who knows you best loves you most. And so when it gets to that part, could we just be overwhelmed? by how much he loves us. And can we in this moment maybe stop singing for a second and invite him to destroy the things that are standing against receiving every bit of his love. May we lay down some things that are filling our heart that are not God's. And may we gaze on the beauty that is Jesus, that is his love for you. Because God loves you. You are his beloved.
may you be dissatisfied with where you are now in God. May we pray that God would guide our hearts into his love. May we find loads of time to gaze on Jesus. May you find your heart having more space. Let that love in. Transform it all so that the world can know this Jesus we know. That's Christmas. That's Jesus. From heaven to earth, celebrate that today. We love you. Have an incredible week. Bless you.